Thank you all so much. I'm Esther, um, as Maria said, um, and we're here with Wendy Ettinger, the um, co-founder of Chicken and Egg, um, Brie Elrod, who's one of the stars of Red Rocket, which was at um, the film festival this year, Rachel Fleet, um, the director of Introducing Selma Blair, and Eliza Hitman, um, director of Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, as well as a number of other great films. Um, so hopefully this is a, will be a free-flowing conversation where everyone can join in. Um, but I wanted to start by sort of going down the line, and if you could all sort of, obviously, Say I introduced you, but introduce yourselves further. To tell us a little bit about your experience in the industry and where you come from. I'm uh, Wendy Enter, so I'm the co-founder of um, Chicken and Egg Pictures and actually Game Changer Films. And um, Chicken and Egg uh, uh, Pictures um, has been uh, funding women and women identifying uh, uh, filmmakers since 2005. Um, I co-founded it with Judith Helfand and Julie Parker Bonello because we'd all been working in the industry. And we, um, and we realized there was such a, a, honestly, a lack of community and resources for women. So we wanted to um, directly address that. Uh, so uh, what Chicken Egg does is combine creative mentorship uh, and funding um, for, for filmmakers. Um, and at this point, it's been, I guess, about 300 and 50, over $8 million, thousands of um, hours of mentorship. Um, and uh, it, what's very, very, very rewarding um, about that is things have changed. Um, and so it used to be I, and I think the difference is there's a we. Um, so all of these organizations now have sprung up. We've all been partnering, like Sundance, like Firelight, like Catapult. So I feel like you know more than ever, women filmmakers um, have a support system and uh, a real community um, that they're working within. Um, and then just a brief word about Game Changer Films, that was the first uh, fund to finance women narrative directors. And that was in 2013, because again, women were not, still not getting um, financed uh, in the way they, they should. Um, and I can talk more about that later. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I'm Bree Elrod, and I was in, uh, am in Sean Baker's amazing, wild, beautiful ride called Red Rocket. Um, many are familiar with his previous films, um, The Florida Project and Tangerine. And I am mostly traditionally have been a theater actor. So this is one of this is my first. Um, co-starring lead role in a film and I am absolutely honored and thrilled to be a part of it and also honored and thrilled to be a part of the New York um, Film Festival. So that's me. I'm Rachel Fleet. I'm the director of Introducing Salma Blair. Um, I'm very excited to say that the film will open theatrically on October 15th in New York and LA and also streaming on Discovery Plus on October 21st. So I hope you guys check it out. And um, prior to that, I have directed three short documentaries, um, one about a couple in a long distance relationship for over 40 years, one on gefilte fish, which really, <laughs> it did, I think it got me the job with um, introducing Selma Blair. And um, another one about uh, two female trans cinematographers who have a really unique friendship named, uh, that's called Ava and Bianca. And then I have some narrative projects that I'm working because I do want to straddle the line between documentary and narrative and even what even is the difference in, in some ways, stories are stories. And then when I'm not doing that kind of stuff, I sometimes direct commercials. So um, all across the board, and I'm so honored to be a part of this panel with these amazing women. Um, hi, my name is Eliza Hitman. I am a filmmaker. I work in film. I work in television. I'm also a professor. I teach at Pratt Institute. And I find myself kind of shuffling back and forth between all those spaces. And when I'm not doing one, I'm doing the other. Right now I'm teaching. I'm going to do some TV in the winter and then hopefully be making a feature sometime in the spring summer or fall i don't really know which it's hard to um it's hard to predict at this moment um but it's nice to 
be here. I haven't done too many of these in the last two years in person. Um, so, hi. <laughs> um, Wendy, I wanted to touch on something that you said because um, you mentioned sort of the change from the I to the we. Um, and I was wondering sort of, from your years, both as a producer and as a co-founder of these organizations, um, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen sort of for women in this space um, over the past several years? Uh, well, ownership is one. So um, you'll see a lot more EPs on narratives and docs. And I think, um, honestly, like in 2005, um, women necessarily weren't uh, uh, financing things on their own. It was different. It was, you know, maybe the men. So um, I think there's been a, a, a change there, um, which has been critical. And then more women are directing, um, either because they're putting together their own production companies, which is fabulous. Um, uh, or, you know, there's now been a, such an awareness in the industry um, that there have been so many missing voices um, that now everybody's grabbing women um, uh, and has been. Um, and so that's a, that's a, a great change um, as well. Yeah, I was, Eliza, I was wondering if you could comment on sort of the financing angle, obviously, like as an independent filmmaker and the struggle to sort of get financing, get financed and how, how from your sort of debut to Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, which was released by Focus, that's changed. Um, I don't, I think, um, yeah, every project has been very different, you know, and comes with its own set of challenges, I would say. I haven't had like a, you know, a, like a direct path into the industry. I don't think any of my films will be that easy to finance, if I'm being honest, because they deal with topics that we are culturally very prudish about. And I don't think that that's something that will change from movie to movie. Um, I Yeah, I mean, the first movie I made was a micro-budget feature, and I sort of did the fundraising for it. I had, like, a Google matching grant and, you know, raised, like, $20,000. And then I had a few financiers who I was connected to through the cinematographer, and they're like, well, if we like the first cut, we'll put in a small amount of money. And I think, you know, that's kind of always the obstacles that you face as a female filmmaker is that there's always like another set of barriers, like people can't just support you out the gate. Um, but from there, you know, I sort of built a long relationship with CineReach and they've been involved in the development of my career and sort of involved in... Um, you know, they fully financed Beach Rats and have given development money to every project that I've worked on, essentially. Um, so, I, you know, I'm grateful, you know, that they were here when they were here, and I don't know who I would be without them. I was wondering if you could talk about sort of both anyone sort of on the panel, but especially Liza and Wendy, because, Wendy, I know you produced The Tale, which was, um, which is another sort of film that deals with hard topics that it, you know are not easy to necessarily draw finance financiers in but bumping up against sort of the lingering conservative elements in this industry i know eliza you posted last year on your instagram the uh letter the email from a uh, oscar voter who refused to watch never really sometimes always because it was about abortion so Obviously, we always have these talks about, you know, women in film are all here, but, you know, how has it been sort of butting up against these these conservative elements still very much a part of the community? Uh, I wouldn't say it was the conservative element. I, I would say um, the issue with, say, Eliza, who is totally brilliant uh, filmmaker. I have to say I'm such a fan of the film. Um, uh, it, in what I've noticed, um, it's more um, auteurs or people who have their own vision. Women have their own vision and women of color have their own vision and want to tell their own stories. And people are like, well, well, that's not, but that's not what we need or well, that's not what's selling. So there are a lot of women being hired, but they're not being hired to tell their stories. And when you do try to tell stories, um, Everyone is like, well, who's going to watch? You know, that's much, much harder to get um, funded or financed. So what we really, really need um, is to create more entities for um, uh, economic and financial um, autonomy uh, for filmmakers so that um, 
so they really have the freedom. Because for Game Changer, that's every single filmmaker was like, being out of the studio system, having that autonomy, having you know a, a group of, um, of financiers come together, finances made all the difference in the world. Eliza, do you have anything to add? Or <laughs> what was the question exactly? <laughs> no worries. I was just wondering, sort of, you know, you mentioned sort of these hard topics, but also, you know, as you um, you encountered pushback to your brilliant film, never rarely, sometimes, always, and you posted this comment from an Oscar voter who refused to watch the film because it was about abortion. Um, and sort of, what has your been experience sort of bumping up against these? these people sort of still in the industry and still sort of resistant to dealing with, to addressing subjects of abortion or women's issues. Yeah, I mean, it creates a lot of frustration and rage, you know, if I'm being honest. And I think that, um, you know, there's an internalized sexism, you know, that exists in women in the industry also and critics and this and that. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's it's really at every turn. You know, it's not just that Academy voter. Um, I do think, you know, and I'm sure people will agree that there is sort of this idea that, you know, stories about or films about men are somehow universal and films that focus on women and their lives are somehow more niche. Um, and that's you know, a generalized way of talking about the challenge. Um, you know, I think, I don't know, you know, I, I, I think for me, you know, I'm vulnerable, obviously, because I'm putting myself out there and, and making work that I want to be seen and, you know, have value. But I also know that the work has less value because of the culture we live in. And I've accepted that on some level, but it doesn't stop me from making, wanting to make work that's challenging or limited in terms of the audience, because those are just words, you know, to protect, <laughs> you know, um, protect an industry from talking about what, what really, what it really means. Well, I, I want to make sure to get Bree and Rachel involved in this conversation. Bree, I wanted to ask sort of, this is your first as you were mentioning, your first sort of co-star lead film role coming from the world of theater. What was what has been sort of most surprising entering the the film world in in this context? Um, well, I would say it's just a completely different beast. I, you know, I've worked so much in the regional theater in Kansas City, um, San Francisco, Chicago, and and being a part of a film is just it's uh, a lot of some people ask me at Cannes does it feel like opening night and I was like no it's completely different because <laughs> this, it, it's just me sitting there and a camera on me walking in in a gown versus at the opening night you have to do the thing you know to, <laughs> you have to do the show you have to and then you hope that you, you've got everything that you you know the rehearsal is all in there for opening night and then you enjoy the, the end of it but it, it's really it's just a, such a different beast and I would say um just coming out of context, like we're in a, in a play, it's all linear mostly, it's written that way. And um, so you do the top of the story and you go through the story and you bring the audience with you. This, you know, you show up on, you know, day two and you're doing the end of the, the movie and it's, it's a completely different headspace. And I quite enjoyed the challenge of it. I thought it was um, exercising a totally different part of my actor brain that I really, thought was fun because I'm like oh we're doing the end today but today's day two okay cool let's do it let's okay I'm ready to I'm ready to, well I won't give any well it's in the trailer anyway I'm like ready to throw the coffee pot let's do that let's okay um so yeah I would say it just is, has been a really fun exploration for me as an artist well you're talking about challenging material Red Rocket is a film with that is it's a challenging film and there's a lot to explore there and I was wondering sort of you know it's also a film about male ego in many in many ways and I was wondering sort of how um Sean Baker uh the director of the film sort of incorporated you and your voice onto set especially in this um especially with this very um, talkative male lead. <laughs> yeah, we talked a lot about um, toxic masculinity and um, how it affects everyone in his life and in his world. And I think what Sean does such a great job of is, you know, there's a scene in which 
uh, Mikey, we were just talking about this back there. Mikey's going on and on about this, and, and Sean focuses on ha the reaction of the female character. And he does that with several moments uh, with June and with Strawberry. He focuses on how this is a affecting the women in this world and how it's not just about uh, how this man exists in it, but how, is, how are these women operating within this world? And I really respected that. I thought he did a very good job of capturing that um, because it is just kind of a whirlwind. And some people have compared Mikey to Trump. Some people have, you know, have said that there's this kind of energy of, um, you know, ego. And it's been, it's just, it's been interesting to, um, yeah, to watch people's response to it. I Rachel, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you came to Selma Blair as a subject um, for your for your documentary. Yeah, I would love to tell you guys. Um, so I had heard about what Selma was going through in the same way that many people did, which was through a social media post that she put out um, a few months after her diagnosis. And uh, a friend of mine had just been working um, with her for something for Vanity Fair. And she introduced us. And um, there was sort of like a stirring around um, Selma and her manager, Troy, because she was about to do something quite um, risky, which is have a stem cell transplant in order to slow the progression of her multiple sclerosis. Um, and they sort of had this inkling that it should be documented. Um, and from there, you know, I met Selma. We immediately connected. I mean, I don't. One of the things that I think is so exciting about the film we made together is that like, I don't know how many people know how funny she is and she's extremely funny. So when we got on this FaceTime call, I'd never met her before. Um, and she was like, so you're bald and I have MS, what are we gonna do about it? <laughs> and it was just like this instant connection. And she actually told me that like my ability to sort of like receive her like disarmingness was part of the reason why she knew that she could trust me, which was really like such an honor. Um, and there was a time schedule in place and quickly we found producers that were willing to take the ride with us. Um, she was about to, to have a stem cell transplant um, a couple months from when we first met on FaceTime and we were off to the races by May of 2019. So it was sort of like, I knew immediately that this woman was super special upon meeting her and they sort of had the inkling that this was something to be filmed. But the thing that I like to tell people is like Selma was not a producer. She didn't step foot into the edit. She, nothing was off limits. We could just, you know, capture what was happening in her life. Um, it's a verite documentary and we go on quite a ride with her, so. Yeah, and it's, it's so moving. I was wondering if you could also talk about how your sort of experience, your personal experience sort of in this industry, in Hollywood, sort of, and also, and how you saw them connect and how you saw them, um, it, and how your experience of your your time evolved with looking at Selma's experience of her time in the industry and in Hollywood. Well, it's interesting because I've, I've noticed that she and I are having sort of a similar experience right now. So I started out in the theater and I actually started out making experimental theater and I quickly fell in love with filmmaking in 2004 and by the time 2007 rolled around I was like wait I want to be a director I don't want to be a producer because I was producing at first and I finally said it out loud I was like this is why I hate the producing it's because I want to be a director like it was like this moment of return of Saturn or something, or I don't know what it was. It was, it was important and it happened. And, um, you know, I, I, I trudged this road, you know, my first film that I directed, I financed out of like extra money that I had and like that from work and got like an ex-boyfriend who I think was currently my boyfriend to, <laughs> to film this first documentary and sort of like plodded along and you know, I had like little successes here and there. And, um, you know, I just watched Selma. Um, we had to go to quite a large event the other day. And I was like, how do you feel about this whole thing? And she's like, well, I've never been in the spotlight before. You know, I've always, and she talks about this in the film. She's like, I've always been a supporting actress. You know, they, they didn't include her on the poster for Cruel Intentions. And so we're sort of having this moment together, like, because this is my first feature and, you know, the, the door has been opened 
um, for me personally, and I feel extremely supported on every level um, after like really trudging for a while. And, um, and she is too, like this is her first starring role. You know, we, we showed up in sequence because it's like we have, we're, we're here and it's time. And I think both of us have sort of plotted our way and um, it's a really exciting moment for, I think, for her just seeing the way that she has um, been able to embrace herself in the film. And also, you know, she gives you permission to embrace yourself. Like, that's been my experience in making it. It's like I, she lost all of her hair in her chemotherapy treatment and she just kind of walked around Chicago bald. And I was like, oh my God, it took me like 30 years to do that mm -hmm. um, and feel confident. And so, yeah, I hope I answered your question and added some stuff. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, super helpful. I, I was wondering if you, if anyone could sort of talk about, um, obviously, Eliza, you've worked in TV and um, and made and your films, and but just sort of if you see sort of a difference um, in the way women's roles are evolving in different sort of corners of the industry, TV versus indie film versus studio work. Wendy. Oh well. Right. Any okay. anyone anyone can answer the question. Uh, all right. <laughs> well, one observation I've made is um, uh, when the women push came uh, around you know 2013, a lot of women directors were making films that were mimicking the guy directed films, like the buddy films, and so what's which was honestly a little disappointing, um, and so now. Um, I think that's changed, and I think uh, women's voices are um, are it, it shown very, very commercial, um, and they have more autonomy now to tell their stories. So, um, so I do think that um, that that shifted in terms of the at least the kinds of stories that um, uh, that are coming now. Does anyone else have any thoughts on the subject about where things diverge, TV versus film, anything? I, I think it always feels like we're moving forward, but then when you look at the statistics, <laughs> you're like, oh, no, no. What, why do I have this perception? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, very often I think you get onto a Zoom and you're like, or in, in these times, you get into a Zoom and you look around, I'm like, oh, I am the only woman on this call. Okay. Yeah. And so I do think it's like we're pushing, we're pushing, we're pushing, but um, just like, I, I just keep thinking about internalized sexism from what Eliza was saying yeah. and, and that there's this thing like just this idea of these stories and like what Wendy was saying like these I have a narrative project that is really just about like being a mother and being a daughter and being a woman in the 21st century and I've been told by multiple female agents that like in terms of like attaching the character who's 47 um, attaching talent to that character that she's very unlikable and it's like really intense to have a conversation with a woman about a woman being unlikable um, it's just like it's like wow okay and I'm just like oh I thought she was kind of real but I'll just keep pushing along but it's it's a thing it's gonna take time yeah did you, Rachel, did you see sort of an easier entry in the documentary space versus the narrative space? Well, it's my only experience thus far, you know? So I think um, I feel so supported in, in the, the introducing Selma Blair team is incredible um, from the very beginning. I mean, Troy, her manager and um, a dear collaborator of mine is like you've got free reign like just go for it and they the the producers um are all men and they are like you go for it girl like they there was no they trusted my creative vision mm -hmm. they're also not um straight cisgender men which i think does have something to do with it not to get like overly political or talk about identity politics but there is something to be said about like a queer team that's telling me to like go for the gold and get and get what I need and we support you along the way. So yeah, my experience so far has been quite good. 
Funny, I was wondering if you could comment on that a little bit, sort of in your work, both Game Changer, sort of in the narrative space and Chicken and Egg in the sort of documentary space. How have you seen sort of differences for women in both of those areas? I think just kind of echoing what you're saying, it's what's been really, really interesting to watch is there are a lot of all female crews or all queer crews. It's like everybody's kind of, let's, okay, let, let, let's do this together. And it's really powerful um, when it happens. Um, and, um, and, and so I've loved, I've loved that. Um, I, I'm going to just say one thing about Chicken Egg for those who don't know one thing is that um, we do have a program um, uh, called the Accelerator Lab, and it is for first and second time filmmakers. So it's just important for those who are thinking about getting into the field to, um, to be aware of that. Uh, to Liza and Rachel, just sort of on the on that subject, sort of how do you think about sort of building your crews and building sort of who is going to be on set with you? Um, I think it's 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 really just about relationships, you know. And you you know, I made one film, and you know, you want to carry the people who you feel you know bring a distinctive vision to what you're doing that is compatible, that expands and supports your vision. Um, and, you know, I think that like diversity on my cruise, it happens organically, you know, and oftentimes there's like a real sort of switch of rules. Like I have like a male editor you know, or, and a female cinematographer. And, um, you know, I, I think it's really about, you know, who supports you and who you like working with. I think you learn very quickly in, especially in being like on a set, you know, what, what isn't right, what doesn't feel good. And you, that's all you have. Totally, I agree. It's like an organic process, and I think just sort of naturally, um, when I'm the way that I approach my work is I'm very much a collaborator. Like I never believe that I have the best idea in the room, and I also look to different perspectives and different voices. So like, if I'm talking about you know certain subject matter, it's really important that I have different perspectives surrounding me. You know, it's like. I definitely am not qualified to talk about the experience of being a person of color. Um, I have my own experience, right, in the world, and that adds my perspective. But just like a well-rounded team to me is people who are coming from the coming to the subject matter from all different places and viewpoints. So, and I think naturally it just ends up being kind of diverse and and female heavy, <laughs> and um, it's really fun. But then also you want to keep. Um, your talent, you know, if there's, if, you know, the talent of like um, a white cisgender man is not like something to exclude in this in this conversation. Like it's a 360 degree experience. So yeah, I'll also just say one other thing. Like I do think it should be a mix. You know, I don't want to be particularly be on like an all female crew. Like I want a mix of perspectives. And I would say on Red Rocket, we had largely, we had a lot of female producers and we had probably half and half. We had a very small crew because of COVID. I mean, we were, I mean, it, filming during COVID was a whole, uh, talk about another beast. That was another <laughs> beast. But it really, I felt very supported as uh, a woman in that environment, knowing that there were female producers. Our acting coach, uh, Samantha Kwan, who's also a producer, was uh, pivotal in in my experience because there were intimate scenes um, there, you know, and, and I felt very supported. Um, and I also think that Sean was completely, um, uh, open to hearing all of my ideas as a female artist, as an artist. And I, I think, yeah, I think that having a, a mix is really ideal um, to get all of the different um, ideas and suggestions and opinions. Bria, I wanted to ask you about that because, I mean, there are moments in the film where you're very vulnerable and there's a lot of, it, it is a, it's, an awesome film. You guys have to see it. <laughs> but I, I wanted to ask about how sort of how in those more vulnerable moments in the sex scenes, in the fight scenes, you were sort of made to feel 
comfortable and safe sort of with this crew on set. Yeah. I would say it was a closed set, so everything was very, um, you know, uh, private for the most part. And I would say that we had really good conversations before each scene of what story are we trying to tell with this intimate scene. And each one had its own story. You know, there's a scene where Lexi's on top, and that is saying something because in the first one, she's not. You know, they're Sean and Chris, the way that they wrote this, it was very deliberate and very specific. And so with each one, we talked through it completely completely before even going through the motions. It was not improvised. Um, that said, we had a lot of fun with it and definitely there's, I'm sure, many outtakes that are wild and crazy. But <laughs> um, but I would say I felt completely comfortable and supported and Sean was very uh, much uh, in, in tune with that and asking me each time, are you comfortable doing this? And when we would film something, he would come and say, Brie, look at this, this is what you're seeing. You know, and I'd say, ah, Awesome. Okay, great. You know, because you're just wearing like nude colored things or if you're completely <laughs> naked, you want to know what what are, what story are we sharing and what are you sharing of me and what is my family seeing? <laughs> 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 what is my dad going to see? I, w I wanted to ask Rachel a question. Am I allowed to ask? Yeah, no, yes, <laughs> yes, please, please. I want you guys, I want well, all of you to ask each other questions as well. Just thinking about this idea of, you know, what kind of environment you create and want to work on and set. You know, I, I don't, I'm not a doctor, but I know that there is like a pretty high mortality rate for stem cell transplants. And I'm just like curious, like what, what is it like to work with this subject that might not make it through the process of making the film? Thanks. That's a really good question, Eliza. Um, I had, it's really interesting because we've, I've been thinking about this process so much lately as like reflecting back and the film's coming out so soon. And, you know, Selma is very funny and she made a lot of dying jokes mm -hmm. and she would be like, I mean, it's kind of a good ending. You know, she kind of like was very like her, her dark humor was something that kind of pulled me out of the reality, to be honest. And because um, each step of the process was so intense for her, I actually just like would go in and film. And in the back of my head, I always knew this was possible, but I didn't want to believe that it was possible. And so I was in a state of a little, like a little bit of a fantasy state, I guess, to be honest, and just like hovering above that reality and just like laser focused on like my task at hand, which was like, OK, it's day 19 of the isolation. Like what is happening here? And I'm going to go in, I'm going to film. And I actually because we weren't allowed to have camera crews during her like serious lockdown, she like basically was quarantined during this process. Um, you could only go in as a visitor, um, you know, with strict hygiene. And so I actually got to film her stem cell transplant on my iPhone, which was amazing. Um, but it wasn't until the edit that I looked back and I was like, that was scary. You know, it wasn't like I feel like I in order to be present for my subject, I had to kind of hover above the reality. And then once we we're in the edit, I was like, this is like a horror film and um, there are parts of it that and we leaned into that and um, with the score um, it was scary. It was real life. It was life and death. Right. Like we always talk as auteurs about like what are the stakes and the stakes were pretty high. They were exceptionally high. So every time she said goodbye to her son, it was really emotional because it was like we don't know. We just didn't know. So I think my brain sort of clicked into a survival mode as an artist and just was like, OK, capture the task at hand. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was, I've been thinking a lot about like, you know, what you went through making that film and just sort of thinking about how it ties into our conversation and just, you know, the fact that she was so sick and nobody believed her, you know, like, why don't we believe in the importance of these stories that people are telling about their lives and the fact that she couldn't convince doctors she was sick. And here we are talking about telling, convincing producers and financiers and studios that these stories are relevant and urgent. And also sort of in terms of Selma's story, the way the media sort of treated the lead up to 
her diagnosis and when she was struggling in public because she was a public figure sort of using it as it's tabloid fodder that all, also is really connected to this whole conversation yeah i think that's got to be so interesting just to be so visible to be a celebrity going through something that it's hard because we we put these celebrities on a pedestal and we want them they're they're all healthy they look perfect they everything's and when someone is so honest and vulnerable about something that's life or death it reminds us of our own mortality and i think that's really scary and i think it's such a brave thing i'm really excited to see this film because i think it's such a brave thing to share with the world when we want to you know there's a lot of celebrities who end up passing you're like i never knew they even had i never knew i never knew and so to actually say this is happening and i'm going to show you at every step of the way i think is beautiful yeah, Rachel, do you have any more thoughts? Obviously, we've just been talking about your film <laughs> at you for a while. No, I, I so appreciate it. It really is a conversation starter. It's like Selma complained of symptoms for many years before um, she was given an MRI and before she saw that she actually had MS. A lot of doctors said, oh, you're getting old and you're tired because you're a, a new mom. And so there was a lot of that. Um, and then also, like, it, there was a decision made to control the narrative of, like, what was happening to her. And she came out on Instagram, um, you know, and Krista Smith, who is a dear friend who's at, who was at Vanity Fair for many years when Selma was being photographed by the magazine, you know, said that that was really important for her to say that she had MS because then the paparazzi wouldn't, like, think that when she was walking with a limp that she was drunk. And it was really important for her, for the world to know. And, and in doing that, it, you know, besides just being like open about what's going on, which I think she really chose to do in, in a very elegant way. Um, also, it's like she starts to help people. I mean, when she when she came out with her MS, um, she said this is not in the film, but she said that um, she was so exhausted from the, writing the post, she sort of took a nap and slept for many hours this that weekend because that was one of the symptoms of her MS. And when she woke up, there was like, I mean, her phone had just blown up. Her Instagram had just um, erupted because of her honesty. Um, and so, yeah, she was honest because it was also a way to protect herself, but it also in turn helped so many people. You know, we have to wind down quickly, but Brie and Eliza, I wanted to ask you both, um, both the Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, and Red Rocket are looking at women in communities, um, in rural communities that don't often get depicted on, you know, in in studio film. And I was wondering sort of how you thought about how the responsibility to the women in those communities that you were portraying. I, I felt like there was a very great responsibility to really listen and honor the community. Um, in South Texas, we filmed this in Texas City, and um, many people, at, Sean Baker is kind of notorious for street casting, and those are some of my favorite stories from the film, are people being like, I worked at a refinery, I was laid off for COVID, then Sean Baker pulled up and was like, you want to be in a movie? <laughs> That's my friend, Brittany Rodriguez. Um, and and my, the woman who played my mother, um, Brenda, she lives in that community and and that down there it's very um ominous and dangerous because of the refineries and there's a lot of a lot going on down there and so i felt like sean was really trying to shine a light on what these people who are surrounded by this power and this money and yet they are living these lives just trying to make ends meet and trying to everyone wants to live a good life that's all you know and I think that's the story that he's really trying to share and so I felt a great responsibility I, I didn't want people in that area to see this film and be like that's nothing like you know what we're experiencing and I think he he found locations that the house that we filmed in many of my scenes and just meeting Brenda and being around Brenda I was like okay okay I'm feeling what you've been experiencing. And I was so honored because in between takes, she would tell us stories about growing up in the area and what it was like. And and um, yeah, I, I think he shows an underbelly that also is hard for people to really uh, want to admit is existing in this country. Um, and so I, I felt honored to be a part of it. Yeah, I, I think you know, for my film, we just, we get a very, 
you know, slice of life moment from my main character's world. It's not really about where, you know, what her life is like in this town. And we're just trying to give some context without making it like a family drama or, you know, I, my goal wasn't really to do anything like ethnographic. It was more just to sort of show in a simple way, you know, what kind of world she's from before she leaves. And for me, it was much more about the journey rather than, you know, the specific challenges of living in Shemokin, Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, uh, but I, do, I was intrigued in that town, uh, with that town and that place um, for, for reasons that aren't explored necessarily in the film. Um, but for me, it was much more about what it's like to be from someplace else in New York navigating a crisis and a city that you've never been to in 48 hours, you know, and that was really the um, intention and it was less about, you know, the, the exact place. Well, to conclude, I, I wanted to sort of end on an optimistic note. What are you all hopeful for? What are you excited for, for the future of women in this industry? I think just more women-led storytelling. I think just it, like to get back to what Wendy said, just the real true experience of that female voice in the mix of the voices of all of all other underrepresented people you know just like adding it to the mix that we expand uh the pov like wider and wider lens as we go forward i would love more roles in that vein. I would love, um, like Eliza was saying, uh, to see stories about women or female identifying um, people that that everyone can identify with, that it's not just, oh, well, we see a man and we can kind of see our own way in as a female, but like, I, I would love more roles that are challenging and interesting and not like the breakdown says uh, everything so specifically about looks, you know, ordinary features, you know, or like, and I'm like, I, right, but I'd, I'd love, I think that the, it would be exciting to look forward to um, diving into roles like that. Oh, wait, 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 I'm going to throw something in. So, um, <laughs> so uh, significant pictures run by, um, uh, you know, Nina Bon Jovi and um, uh, Game Changer Films. I'm sure others have these shadowing programs. So um, for unrepresented um, uh, voices, uh, they're able and, and um, possible producers. Essentially, they are brought onto sets to work directly under other producers. So this this very um, great kind of mentorship. So I would I think it's about nurturing that pipeline, especially women of color, and um, uh, and getting them in there so that they have um, the experience, very hands on experience and connections, because um, there's a lot of catching up to do. Well, great. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>